Good evening, everyone. We are beginning a new series tonight, which is based upon the writings of Pirkei Avais, which is called The Ethics of Our Fathers. This is a special time of the year in the Jewish calendar. This is the time of Sphere Sa'imer, which is the counting of the Oimer, which is preparing us for the great and glorious day of Shavuos when we receive the Torah as a nation. And one of the things that the Jewish people had to work on, on those 49 or 50 days as they were fleeing from Egypt and running through the wilderness, preparing themselves for receiving the Torah, is what one of the statements in Pirkei Ovas writes is, Derech Eretz Kadma Torah, which means that the, the type of midas of character development and the refinement of one's behavior, that is something that must precede the receiving of the Torah. And therefore it's become very customary in these six weeks or seven weeks that we have before Shavuos comes, that the Jewish people across the world, they learn Pirkei Avos. Because the ethics of our fathers is a work written by our great sages, the Tanoim, the masters of the, of the Mishnah, in which each and every one of these Mishnayas, each and every one of their sayings and their statements are wellsprings of wisdom and of insight of how a person refines their Derech Eretz, their character and the nobility that reigns within the Jewish Neshama. And so therefore it is our custom, many people do it on Shabbos, we don't have the luxury of being together on Shabbos and Shul at this point, but at least we can get together Wednesday nights and we can follow the ancient custom of learning the words of Pirkei Avos together to help to inspire us to work on ourselves, to acknowledge and to recognize the areas of our inner self that require work. And then with the words of Pirkei Avos, with the words of the ethics of our fathers, we shall learn how to actually institute that and implement these ideas. So each week, from the time of Pesach until Shavuos, there's a different chapter that relates to that week. And this is the week of the third chapter in Pirkei Avos. So there's many Mishnayis, there are many statements that we have throughout this chapter. And as I was looking, it struck me that not only is this the time of the, not only is this the time of preparing for Kabbalah Sator, for receiving the Torah at our Sinai and Shavuos, but it's also very memorable as being the time in which we mourn the loss of the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. And how fitting it would be as we start and embark into the words of Pirkei Avais, if we actually find in this week's chapter words of Rabbi Akiva himself, and perhaps it will give us even more of an insight into the greatness of that man, and the message that his life leads over, leaves over for each of us. So the Mishnah says over the following words. Hu ha'yo'ymer, Rebbe Kiva said over the following statement. Now in reality, the sages teach us that Rebbe Kiva said over many, many things. We find his name throughout Shas, throughout all of the Talmud, throughout Midrashim. Everywhere you look, you find Rebbe Kiva. Rebbe Kiva was the disseminator of the Torah that in which we live upon for generations, thousands of years already. So when it says, Hu ha he said the following words. This is one of his famous statements that Rabbi Kiva said because he felt that this was an intrinsic way for a person to be able to live their life. What did he say? And this is the third chapter of Pirkei Avais, the 14th Mishnah. He said over the following, Chaviv Adam, Man is beloved, Shinivra B'Tselem, because he was created B'Tselem in the image of God. How do you know that Adam, that a human being, is someone that is beloved, that is treasured, that is so fine in the eyes of Hashem? Because he was Nivra B'Tselem, he was created in the divine and the godly image. Chiba Yisera Noida'as Loi, and there's an even greater love that Hashem did for this person and gave to mankind. Not only did he create us in his image, not only did he invest us and imbue us with godliness, 
Not only do we have character traits that resemble the traits of the creator and the master of the universe, but what good would it do to us if we did not know them? We were not informed of them. That we had no idea that we were carrying around a gold mine of spirituality inside of us. And therefore, since that Hashem loves mankind so much, therefore, he let him know. He indicated to him. He taught him that, man, you are created in my image. Shenema, like it says in the verse in the Torah, Kibit Selim Eloikim Asa Esa Adam. That in the image of God, man, Hashem made man. So this is the first statement of Rabbi Akiva tonight. Number one, each and every one of us has to know, Chaviv, we are beloved. We are special. We are precious. We are lofty neshamas. We are beautiful souls. How do we know that? Because the master of the universe, the Yitzhar HaNeshamas, the creator and the former of all of the souls that would ever exist in all of history, Hashem Yisbarach, the Holy One, blessed be He, He was Naida'as, though He told us. Where did He tell us? He told us in His holy work, the Torah. And He writes over there, you should know, Ki Selim Eloikim, Asa Esa Adam, in my image, says God. I made man. Now Hashem doesn't have a portrait. Hashem doesn't say cheese. He doesn't smile. He doesn't work on his hairstyle to make sure that it looks good in every picture. What's the right side? He doesn't have any of that. So what does it mean that we are bitzel and we are in the image of God? There's a godliness inside of us. Of course, as all of the Mephoshim, the commentators speak out, there is no shape. There is no form. There is no image. There is no picture that you can have of Hashem. But there, are the, there is the essence of the Rebbein Shalom. There are his midas, his character traits, which he shares with us so that we should have a, a, an, an insight into who he is and what he's really all about. He teaches us through the words of his Torah, through the events that are taking place around us in this world, through the events that take place in our own life where we see the tremendous amount of Ashkacha, of divine intervention, where Hashem maneuvers worlds for us to bring everything about exactly as it should be. So what is the tzelem, what is the image in which we are created in? And that is that just like HaKadosh Baruch Hu is merciful, you should be merciful. Hashem is compassionate, you should be compassionate. Hashem is holy, you should be holy. Hashem cares and He's concerned and He watches out for each and every person that is under His jurisdiction, which is the entire universe. So whoever we have an opportunity to be within their jurisdiction, whoever we can bring into our kanfei hashchina, under our wings of the shechina, so we have an obligation as well to look and to see and to care and to be concerned about them. The godliness that a person has inside of themselves is how much you will emulate and you will liken and you will guide your life according to the beautiful and glorious ways of Hashem. And Hashem told us that. And that means He doubly loves us. Because imagine that we had the treasure inside to be godly people with divine inspiration with souls that are elevated to the highest of heights. But we had no idea at all what we could accomplish because we didn't even know what's there on the inside of us. There's a famous story with a great Rosh Hashiva by the name of Chaim Kreisworth. He was known as one of the greatest geniuses of the generation. He passed away perhaps about 10 years ago. And he was a man who at the age of 17 years old had to go through the Holocaust. And he had many miracles, one after the other, how he survived. While he was there in the camps, he met an, he met an older man. And the older man was very impressed by Rav Chaim Kreisworth, by his brilliance and his midos, his character. And even in those dark days 
with Gehenim, the flames of, of Gehenim roaring around them, he was able to maintain a demeanor that bespoke saintliness. When this man was dying and his life was ebbing away, he called for Rav Chaim Kreisworth and he said, he said to him, my dear, my dear land, you look to me like a very reliable and trustworthy person. I'm going to share information with you and I beg of you, please, don't forget what I tell you. He said, I'm really a wealthy man and I have Swiss bank accounts with what in that time was considered to be millions and millions of dollars with treasures as well. I have a son. His name is Shlomi. I don't know where he is. I don't know if he survived. I don't know if the Nazis, Yimach Shimon killed him. I have no idea. But if my son Shlomi is alive, I want him to know that he is the inheritor of riches of millions. So I'm going to tell you all of my personal information and I'm going to give you my account number. It's a long number, but you're a bright boy. You'll remember it. There was no place to write these things down. And so the man told over to him where, which bank it was and where it was located. He told him his family name, the security code, and he gave him the long account number to that Swiss bank account that was worth millions of dollars. And after he gave over the last bits of information, he died. Rav Chaim Kreisworth was Zeichi, he merited to survive the Holocaust and the concentration camps. He became a Rav for a certain time in America, and he also became a great Rosh Hashiva in Antwerp. And eventually, at the end of his life, in his, in his later years, he ended up in, as a Rosh Hashiva in Eretz Yisrael in what he felt was the greatest homecoming of his life. And all of his life, he never forgot the dying words of this man. If you ever find my son, Shlomi, please tell him. Tell him what he has waiting for him in that bank. And so if Christworth had written down all the information, and everywhere that he went in life, he always looked for people that fit the bill. Came from Poland, survived the war, small shtetl, lost contact with their parents, ended up making it to wherever they might have been, America, and to a barrier as well. And at any chance that he had, when someone seemed to have those qualities, he would begin asking them one question after the other. What city are you from? What was your father's name? Where were you during the war? What were the last words of your father? And so on and so forth. And for many, many, many years, he tried in vain to find Shlomi. Once while he was a Rav in Eretz Yisrael, he gets a knock on the door and there is a poor bedraggled beggar who comes into his house begging for a few coins. And the man sits down, the Rav Chaim Kreisworth gets him a drink and he looks at him and he asks him, where are you from? And he tells him, I live here in Yushalayim. And he says, is that where you are born? And the man says, no, I come from Poland. He says, really, you come from Poland? What town in Poland? And the man answers his question, the exact town where this man came from so many years ago. Do you know where your father and your mother are? No, the man says, I have no idea. I lost contact with them in the war. I assume many years ago, they must have died at the hands of the Nazis. Your father was a businessman? Yeah, why are you asking so many questions? I'm just asking for a donation, please. And Rav Chaim keeps pressing one piece of information after the other, and finally he says, is your name Shlomi? And this poor, destitute beggar from the streets of Jerusalem looks at me and says, how did you know that? He says, hold on for one moment. And he runs into the other room, and he pulls out a piece of paper, and he says to Shlomi, this is from your father. This is the bank account that he had before the war. There are literally millions of dollars waiting for you. Shlomi, with the shock of his life, he says, are you kidding me? He says, I'm not. 
Is your name Shlaimi? The last name, the town, everything, yes. And Chaim Kreiser picks up the phone. He calls a lawyer. They start making all the arrangements. And the next thing you know, he's on a plane heading off to Europe. And he comes back to Yerushalayim, Shleime the Gvir, the wealthy man. What's the amazing point of this story? Was he a millionaire only when he got the money? Or was he a millionaire the entire time? The reality is that he was a millionaire from the moment that his father died because he inherited all of those funds. But if you don't know what you have, if you don't know that there's millions in the bank, then you can walk around the streets of Jerusalem all of your life begging for a few dimes to be able to buy yourself a challah for Shabbos. Says the Mishnah over here in the words of Rabbi Akiva, Chaviv Adam, man is beloved. Why? Because we're created with Selim Elohim in the image of God. But what an awful tragedy it would be if a person never knew who you really are on the inside. If you never knew that you had a godliness, a soul that is so high and so lofty and could accomplish so much. What a travesty. So in Chiba Yisera Nudasloi, says Rabbi Akiva, Hashem loves us so much that he informed us that we are spiritual millionaires, that we are walking around with much more than Swiss bank accounts, much more than treasures and gold and pearls. We are walking around literally with diamonds, diamonds of the soul, which are so giant and so big and so lofty and so great. That once that you realize who you are on the inside, you will walk around with pride for the godly soul that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has invested inside of you. But Rabbi Akiva doesn't stop over there. And then he writes, Chaviv in Yisrael. Beloved is Yisrael, the Jewish people. Shinikru banim lamokayim. Because we are called banim, we are called Hashem's children. Yes, mankind is known as Tselem Elohim. We're the image of God. We can do so much. We can produce so much. We can change the world. But Klal Yisrael, no matter where they go in life, no matter what century, no matter what generation, no matter what land we find ourselves in, we are Bonim Lamakim. We are the children of Hashem. But that's not enough, says Rabbi Akiva. Because what a disappointing tragedy would be in our lives if our Father in heaven, the Rabbi Nishalom, was our Father. And He watches over us and He cares about us and He looks into our lives. And He makes sure that every little detail is taken care of. But we walk around like an orphan in this world. And we have no idea at all who our Father in Heaven is. And therefore says the Mishnah, Hashem loves us so much, He gave us more love, and more care, and more hugs, and more kisses. By what? By letting them know, You are called my children, says Hashem. Shenema, like it says in the verse, Bonim atem Hashem elokechem. You, Klal Yisrael Hashem, told us in his Torah, you are children to Hashem your God. It's like a prince who somehow gets stranded somewhere along the way in his life, and he gets separated from his parents, and he grows up as a peasant amongst beggars, and he has no idea that he is a child of the king. And one day he gets a private audience with the king himself. And he says to the king, please help me, I have no money. I have no food, please give me a meal. And the king looks at him, he says, you look so familiar, my child. What is your name? He says, I have no idea. I was found in some town along the way off the forest. Nobody knows where I came from. And the king says, come closer. And his little son, before he lost him, 
He had a special birthmark right over here behind his ear. And the king looks and he sees, Lo and behold, my son, Bonim atem la'ashem alokeichem. You are my child. You walked around 20, 30 years of your life. You had no idea. And now I'm telling you, says Hashem, you're mine. And I'm your father. And what would a father not do for his child? Says Rabbi Akiva, because that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us so much, he cannot let us go blindly in this world. It's not enough that you know that you're Tzalim Elokim, that you have godliness. You must know that you are a child of the Rebbe Nishayim. And that's carte blanche. That's special services. Those, that's a membership that trumps everything. And what a crime if we lived in this world all of our lives and we never realized whose child we really are. Says Rabbi Akiva, Hashem wants Klal Yisrael to know. He wants us to know the greatness that is there inside of us and he wants us to be aware of all of the time that our Father in Heaven is always watching us. But that's not enough, says Rabbi Akiva. And then he writes and he concludes with these words. Chaviv in Yisrael, Klal Yisrael is so beloved to Hashem. Shenitan lehem klichem do, he gave us his most precious treasure. Which of course is referring to the Torah. Chiba Yisrael noidas lehem. And is an even greater love with extra hugs and extra kisses. Shenitan shenoidas, he let us know. That he gave us the Torah which created the world. Shinema, like it says, I've given you a precious treasure. My Torah, that's what I gave you. Don't leave it, please, says Hashem. Not only are we created in the image of God, not only are we bunny and we are the children of Hashem. But on top of that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the greatest gift of all. He gave us the manual, the rule book, the directions of how to play in the game of life, of how to wake up in the morning and go through the entire day till you fall asleep at night with the words of Shema on your lips. How to treat a, a husband, how to treat a wife, how to treat your children, how to be nice in line at the bank, how to be patient, with your patients at the doctor's office who are driving you nuts. The Torah has given us all of the rules and all of the regulations and all of the advice of how to maximize the tzelem elokim, the godliness that is inside of us, and to appreciate what it means to be the banim l'maka in the children to Hashem. Now it's striking that these are the words of Rabbi Akiva. Because the life of Rabbi Akiva himself is perhaps one of the most powerful, miraculous testimonies to the power within a human being to accomplish and to achieve and to strive and to grow and to change in ways that are seemingly humanly impossible. We'll just briefly tell you the biographical sketch of the life of Rebbe Akiva. Until the age of 40 years old, he was an ignoramus. He was, came from a religious family, but he was a simpleton. He didn't do so well in his learning. He wasn't the Rebbe's favorite student. He already seems that as a young boy, he was already out of the classroom. And he became a roya, he became a shepherd. And the shepherd that he was, very nice, Take the sheep around, make sure they have what to eat, graze in the right fields. Very nice, beautiful. But he didn't know an aleph from a base, a gimel from a dalid, a posig in the chumash to a word in the gemara. He knew absolutely nothing. One day he's working in the house of one of the richest men in all of Jerusalem, Kalba ben Savua. 
and he shepherds, he flocks the sheep of Kalba ben Savua. He has a daughter, Kalba ben Savua, whose name is Rachel. And she's watching every day this young shepherd boy, he's not so young, 40 years old, going out, dutifully doing his job. And she sees, as the Gemara tells us, it says, Chazise barte dahavet senia ma'ale. She saw that he was a modest person of very fine character. And she thought to herself, why is such an outstanding character person like this? Someone who is so noble and so refined. Why is he so, so ignorant when it comes to the words of Torah? Why doesn't he know any? Why is he just hurting sheep? This man can go on to become one of the greatest sages of all time if you just channel his energies into the right place. And so she did something very unorthodox. She went out into the fields and she said, Akiva, I'll make you a deal. If you will marry me, I will send you off to yeshiva. You will go and you will learn and you will become a sage that all of the Jewish people remember for generations, for all of history. And Akiva took her up on the offer. And he went, as we know the story goes on, 24 years sat and he learned until he came home to his wife with 24,000 students. And he was revered as Rebbeinu the Moreno, Rebbe Akiva, the greatest sage of the time. How does a person at 40 years old who doesn't know anything, and the Gemara tells us besides that, when he was a younger man, he despised Torah scholars. He couldn't stand seeing them. How does a person with such negativity towards Torah, with no, no ingenious aspects of a Torah sage, with no learning under his belt, nothing, how is he transformed? Because his wife tells him, go and learn and you will accomplish. What was the private conversations of Rabbi Akiva and his wife? Perhaps Rabbi Akiva is telling us in this Mishnah the secret to his life and the secret to anyone's spiritual success in this world is one thing. You must know where you are coming from. You must know who you are on the inside. You must know the greatness, the godless, the awesomeness, the tremendous levels of spiritual prowess that exist inside of you. And once that you realize three things, it's impossible that you will not succeed in Torah. Number one is, you are Selim Elohim, says Rabbi Akiva. You are created in the godly image. You are divine. Your neshama is above and beyond this world, just like Hashem is not confined by this world. Nothing holds him back. Your neshama, which is a piece of Hashem himself, is not confined or restricted by this world. And there is nothing ultimately that is going to be out of your grasp to accomplish in spirituality. But you have to know who you are. You have to know the gold and the silver and the Swiss bank accounts of ruchnius of spirituality and greatness inside of you. And you have to appreciate it. And you have to begin working with that passion and that drive, understanding that nothing is going to stand in your way. And number two, don't forget, you are banim la Hashem elokechem. The Jewish people have a very special place in this world. And that is that we are referred to as his children. A child gets the loving kindness of his father no matter what, no matter when, no matter how. And even though that the Gemara tells us also the statement of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva once had an argument with a man by the name of Tonus, Tonus Rufus Arasha. He was one of the Roman soldiers, officers, who was a very wicked person. And he asked Rabbi Akiva, is it true that you are sons of the Rebbeinu Shalom? Are you the children? 
or are you the avadim, are you the slaves of your, of your master God? And Rabbi Akiva told him, in every single situation that we go through in life, no matter what a Jew does, no matter where a Jew goes, no matter how far and how distant we will get from our Father in heaven, HaKadosh Baruch reminds us, Bonim Lashem Elokeichem, you should never forget, you are my child. It's what we call a mitzvah, it's a reality. The reality is a father always loves his son. He always loves his children. No matter what they do, he always finds a way to justify and to excuse them and to love them. And therefore the son always has the support of his father. Says Rabbi Akiva, who was I? 40 years old, ignoramus, didn't know an aleph from a base, didn't know anything about the world of Torah. I despised the scholars. How did I become the great Rebbe Akiva from which all of the Torah in the world today emanates from? Because when I began to realize who I was on the inside, that I wasn't just a simple shepherd boy, but rather I'm Tselem Elohim, I am godliness. My nisham is big and beautiful and gigantic. And that no matter how far away I am from my father in heaven, I am his son, I'm his child. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants that I should succeed. And I will accomplish. And I will live up to the vision and the image and the hopes and the aspirations of my wife and what I have on the inside of myself. So then whatever you want to accomplish in your life, says Rabbi Akiva, it is impossible that you will not reach that. And what are we going to do that with? Says Rabbi Akiva, there's one thing that will unify the soul and your divinity with our Kodesh Baruch Hu. There's one thing. There's only one way that you'll be able to get clarity and gain an understanding and realize what you can accomplish in this world. And says, that, says Rabbi Akiva, you know what that is? Of course you do. That's Torah. Torah, like the Maharal writes, is the Das Elokis. It's the mind of the Rebbe Nishoilam. It is his Ratzon and his will. It's the messages that he gives over to us, training us, teaching us, encouraging us, coddling us, helping us to maximize that potential that's on the inside. Said Rabbi Akiva, once that I realized the powerhouse that Torah is, that it is literally the battery pack of this world and of myself, then I threw myself into my studies. I went day and night and night and day. He embarrassed, the Chazal, the sages tell us, he embarrassed himself so much, he went to a cheder, to a little a school of little boys, and he walked into a room preschool, where they were learning olive bays. And he said to the boys, teach me, what are you learning? And they laughed at the 40-year-old man who didn't know how to say an olive or a base. And they said, okay, we'll teach you. Olive, base, gimel, dalid. And then he learned all the olive base. And then he moved to the next class. And he said, what are you learning? We're learning psukim in the chumash. Verses in the Torah, teach me. And they taught him, he learned all the Chumash. Then he went to another class, what are you learning? Now he's with third graders, Mishnah. Teach me, he learned Mishnah. And before he knew it, he went to the great study halls of the greatest teachers of that generation. And he went row by row, the way that it worked was the less knowledgeable you were in the back and you worked your way up to the front. Until Rabbi Akiva found himself sitting at the feet of Rabbi Eliezer and the great sages, Rabbi Yeshua of that time. And he became known in history as Rabbi Akiva, who even Moshe Rabbeinu, when he saw into the future, 
The life of Rabbi Akiva, he was nishtayimim, he was stupefied, he was amazed that there was such a human being like this. Says Rabbi Akiva, you know what the secret is? It's very simple. Three things. Know who you are. You're godly. Know who you are, who your father in heaven is. You're a child of Hashem. And know that the most powerful tool that we have in this world is something called Torah. If a person does that, and a person learns that, and a person lives like that, then there's nothing at all that is going to stand in their way. We are in the period of time, as we mentioned, called the Sphere Sa'imer. This is where we are counting up to the great and glorious day of Shavuos. We pray and we hope that Halavai will be back together in Shul by that night so we can learn the Torah together all night long. But we don't know. Only HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows our Father in Heaven who loves us so much. He knows what is best for us. But as we are preparing ourselves during this period of the year, and we are making the Derech Eretz Kadma the Torah, the refined nobility of our neshamas, of our mitos, of our character, of our traits, of our personality better. Don't despair that you cannot accomplish. Don't ever give up hope that you won't achieve the goals that you would like to achieve in life. Because once you know where you're coming from, once you know who you are, once you know that there is godly, greatness on the inside of you, just waiting to pop out and burst out into this world? And you believe in it with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your might? Nothing will ever get in your way. And if we want to grow, and I'm sure that we all do, besides the outward growth that we're all having during this coronavirus over here, if we want to grow in our spiritual terms, if we want to grow in our adherence to mitzvahs, if we want to grow in our moon in our faith, and our bitachin and our trust, if we want to grow in our appreciation of what it means to be a Jew, what it means to be godly, if we want to grow in our connection to our Kodesh Baruch, our Father, then this is the time to do it. Because we've got plenty of time on our hands. We have plenty of time in isolation to stop and to think. We have plenty of time just to sit back and relax and study our lives and ask ourselves, how many things have we not accomplished because we simply don't believe that we have the power within? How many lists in our lives did we make of all the things that we would like to accomplish and achieve in a week, in a month, in a year? And then you find those lists lying around the house 10 years later. Oh, I still didn't do this. I didn't do this. I didn't do, okay, maybe next year, maybe next 10 years. It's only because we don't, we don't understand and we don't appreciate and we don't see what there is on the inside. If we would, if we would see that, then there literally is nothing that would stop us. And Rabbi Akiva is the role model he is the master example of a person who went from zero to 60. In, it took 24 years, yes. And it took a lot of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, humility, embarrassment. Yeah, it took all of that. But guess what? He accomplished it at the end of the day. Why? Because he believed. If you put your mind to something and you know that you have the power of HaKadosh Baruch behind you, then you will achieve as well. So we have to become achievers. We have to become people that during this time of the virus where we're at home alone or with our children, with our families, we have to become people that will dedicate ourselves to growth, to spiritual growth. Yes, like I said, we're all busting at the seams over here, but we need spiritual growth to be bursting at the seams. Like it says in the Pasuk, the nefesh, the soul, is never satisfied. Says the Maharal, when it comes to eating, you can get satisfied. When it comes to sleeping, you can have enough sleep. When it comes to the luxuries, a fancy vacation, a nice watch, good clothes, you can get satisfied. 
But when it comes to Ruchnius, when it comes to spirituality, Hanefesh Loisimale, the soul is never ever satisfied. It craves more and more and more. But we have to want. And we have to appreciate. And we have to see that greatness that is on the inside of us. And when we do, and we realize it, and we believe in it, a person will grow exponentially in ways that they never, ever dreamed that they possibly could. I want to leave off with a Meister with a story. There's a beautiful new book that was printed recently. It's the life and the times of Rebson Esther Jungreis. She was a, a magnificent woman. She herself survived the Holocaust. Her parents survived the Holocaust miraculously. They ended up coming to America and they were a very religious family and this woman had a calling. She had a calling to go and to rescue the Jewish people. It was after the war, six million Jews had died, one and a half million children no longer in the world and she felt a mission to go and to bring the message of Judaism to the world, to the Jewish people, to the best of her abilities. And even though that it was quite uncharacteristic for a very religious woman to get up in public and start giving drushes to hundreds of people, with the blessings of the leaders of the generation, she went and she went on a mission. And she went on a journey that would take her 50 years of her life to be Makarv, to reach out to every Yiddish and Neshama, every Jewish soul that she possibly could. And this book, which is so thick and dense, is filled with her beautiful life message. And it is also filled with story after story after story of her belief in the power of the Jewish soul and Hashem and the Torah. And now with a few words, of conviction, she changed people's lives all around. She was once in Portland, Oregon for a big speech to the community. And she had been traveling and she'd been there already for the entire day. And she spoke for several hours, if I'm not mistaken, in this particular speech. And then after the speech was over, she sat and she met whoever wanted to speak to her afterwards. And it was the end of a long, tiring, exhausting day, and she had a red-eye flight back to New York. Because if she'll take the red-eye flight from the West Coast, she'll arrive in New York early in the morning, get home, and she'll be able to serve her children breakfast before they go to school. Because as she said, saving the Jewish people is a wonderful cause, but not at the expense of your children. So she gets onto the plane, literally exhausted and spent from the entire day. And she just wants to really go to sleep. And she notices there's a young man that is sitting next to her. She doesn't really pay too much attention. And she begins to close her eyes and go to sleep. And suddenly she hears this person say to her, do you live in Oregon? And she says, no. And she realizes this man is talking to her. Maybe he's actually a Jew. You never know. And if he's a Jew, I'm obligated to spend my time talking right now. Maybe I can help him change his life. So suddenly she perks up. And she says, no, I'm, I was just here to give a speech. He says, oh, really? What venue? She says, a synagogue. And he immediately shoots out, not for me. Aha, she says, he's definitely a Jew. And she says to him, you look like a nice Jewish boy, right? He says, I'm only Jewish because I was born Jewish. I'm going to have a Jewish family. But I didn't really have a choice in the matter. As a matter of fact, some people are born Muslim. Others are born Hindu. I happen to be born in a Jewish home. But don't worry about it, miss doesn't make a difference to me. I don't let my Judaism get in my way. Not even a little bit. So at this moment, the stewardess is coming around with dinner. And they serve Rebus and Young Rice, her kosher meal. And then the stewardess says to the young man, and what can I get for you? 
And he says, I'll take the ham and cheese sandwich. I was in Yud Reis in shocked. Nice Jewish boy eating ham and cheese, not going to happen on this flight. So she turns to the boy as he's receiving the sandwich and he says to her, you can't have that sandwich. He says, what do you mean? I ate ham and cheese all the time. She says, but you just told me you're a Jew, didn't you? He said, so what? I told you I don't do anything about my Judaism. She says, so, but you're a Jew. So put down the sandwich. You're not going to eat it. And tell the stories that you want something else to eat. Ham and cheese is not for you. So the man looks at her and he says, I told you, I don't practice my Jewish religion. And I do whatever I want. So stop telling me what to do. She said, it's not me telling you what to do. It's you. What? He says, she says, you heard me. You signed a binding contract which doesn't allow you to eat ham and cheese sandwiches. I don't understand what you're saying, he says. I didn't sign a contract not to eat ham and cheese. She said, oh, yes, you did. When you were standing at Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, where all of the neshamas, all the souls of the Jewish people were, each and every one of us signed a contract that said we will keep all of the commandments in the Torah, and one of them is you can't eat ham and cheese. So you signed the contract. Now this guy now had enough already. And he says, you know something, lady? You are nuts. You are crazy. I mean it. You're out of your mind. And with that, there was silence. She was embarrassed in front of the entire plane. She didn't say a word. And they did not talk to each other for the rest of the flight. As a matter of fact, they just made it as if they never even mentioned, they never even spoke. The flight lands in JFK early in the morning. They get off the plane. She goes to get her luggage, she goes to get his, and lo and behold, there by the baggage claim, Rebison Young Rice and the young man from Oregon, they meet each other. And at his last glance that he has at her, he looks over, he walks over, and he looks at her again, and he says, lady, you know something? You are crazy. But the Rebetzin doesn't even bat an eyelash. She says to him the following words. My name is Esther Jungreis. This is my card. Take it. Call me when you're ready. She says, you know what? Better yet, and he said, better yet, why don't you come down and visit me in my office? I have an organization called Hineni, and over there I teach young Jewish people like you who don't really know what it means to be a Jew. I teach them about their heritage. Why don't you come down when you're ready? So the man thought that she was kidding. Couldn't understand. Is she serious? Is she kidding? I called her crazy. I told her to leave me alone. I told her I don't care about Judaism. And she's inviting me with such refinement and nobility and sweet, gentle ways to come to her office and talk about what it means to be a Jew. But she stared looking at him, completely self-assured in the message that she had to give. And he, she said once again, I'm serious. Why don't you come down to my office when you're ready and I will give you a guided tour of the beautiful legacy and heritage that we have as being a member of the Jewish people. She said, with just a little bit of learning, your entire life will change. And she handed him her card. She went to a taxi went back to Woodmere, and he went on his way wherever he was going. And she forgot about the story after some time. Quite a number of years later, she is giving a lecture, and she sees a yeshiva bacher walk in to the room where she's speaking, and she looks at him, and she thinks to herself, he looks vaguely, I can't place him. And she continues giving the lecture time to time, looking at him to try to figure out, she can't figure out. 
When the lecture is over, this young yeshiva man comes over to her and he says, Rebetzin, do you remember me? Now she met thousands of people in her life and she in fact did not always remember everybody. So she had a famous line and she said, you look familiar to me. He said, Rebetzin, do you remember the plane? Do you remember the sandwich, the ham and cheese sandwich? Her eyes light up. She said, you're the boy from Oregon? Yes, I'm the boy from Oregon. She said, what happened? She said, I want you to know, I thought you were crazy that night. But those words that you said kept lingering in my ears. With a little bit of learning, you will change your life. At one point I decided I better take this Rebison up on her offer. And I went and I began learning and seeking and searching. And here I am today. He said, Rebison, can I ask you for one more favor? She said, sure, Shefala, what, would you, what can I do for you? He said, do you think you could find me a shidduch of somebody else that was standing there by Mount Sinai and signed on the contract as well? And she said, it will be my pleasure. And sure enough, Rebison Young Rice, from a few words in the airport by the baggage claim, changed this boy's life, and yes, she found him a shidduch as well. If a person doesn't know what they have on the inside of them, if we don't appreciate the godliness and the greatness and the child that we are to the Rebbeinu Shalom and the klichemda, the greatest gift of all the Torah, then what good is it worthless? We're multi-billionaires and zillionaires. But we have absolutely no idea what's in our back pocket or in our front lawn. Says Rabbi Kiva, it took me 40 years to understand this. But the moment that I realized how great I am on the inside, and that I have a cheerleader in the heavens, the Rebbe cheering me on every step that I take. And the Torah is the guidebook and the directions and the map for life. Then it's impossible that a person is not going to accomplish spiritual goals that they set for themselves. It's not even worth our thoughts, said Rabbi Akiva, to think that we won't accomplish and achieve. Because certainly you will. And therefore, Be'ez Hashem, if we take these words of Rabbi Akiva to heart, number one, that we are imbued and invested with godliness, that's the soul that we have inside of us. It is limitless of what it could accomplish. No holds barred. And number two, never forget who you are and where you come from. You are a child of, Hash of Hashem and a father will never ever give up hope on their children. A father will always work sometimes even behind the scenes to try to make things better for them. And the father will always love and always care and always be there and always support. No matter what it is that we do, no matter how far we might stray, no matter how many years in a row we might be hopeless and helpless and unaccomplished. It says Hashem, you're my child. What father, what parent wouldn't do everything in their abilities to make things better for their children? And number three, remember, we don't have to figure it all out on our own. Hashem has given us the klichem, the, the greatest treasure that the world has to offer. And that's Torah our guidebook, our directions. It's our GPS in this world of how it is that we can live our lives properly. And when you have these three things behind you and you recognize the inner strength that is within, so even if you don't become a Rebbe Akiva and you don't become the leader of the generation and you don't have 24,000 students who, and you become recognized as one of the greatest sages of all time. Nevertheless, you will still become the greatest spiritual Jew and the spiritual you that you could possibly become. We should be Zeichem Yitzhak Hashem. We should merit that in these trying times for the entire world, 
and especially for the Jewish people, because we are so far away from the place that we know in our comfort zone of how we're going to grow and to achieve higher levels in our ruchnias, in our solitude and in our isolation. Let us take the proper steps to introspect and see what we have going on inside and in that zechus and that merit will grow beyond our wildest dreams. And just as Rabbi Akiva was the one who ended up bringing Torah to Klal Yisrael, we'll be zeichet to bring the Torah to ourselves, to our beloved, to our loved ones, to our families, to our communities. And we should be zeichet to the ultimate revelation of Hashem's love and kindness and compassion. Yes, with the removal of this virus, Yes, with the end of all the deaths. Yes, wiping away the tears of all the Yisayim and the Almanas. Yes, but the ultimate of ultimate, which will be the Bi'as Goyal Tzedek, the coming of Mashiach Sikeinu, Bimheira Bi'amenu.